Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Cotton Grower Magazine's Cotton Companion Podcast. This is Jim Stedman, editor of Cotton Grower, and I don't know how things are in your area, but this year's cotton harvest is underway across large portions of the cotton belt. Here in the Mid-South, we're into week three of some dry, sunny, open weather, with at least one more week of this weather on the way, if if you believe the forecasts. And growers are taking advantage of the opportunity. I recently drove down into the Mississippi Delta for a cotton research event and was absolutely astounded and pleased with the number of cotton fields that had already been picked clean and lined with rows of yellow and pink modules just waiting for the gin. Most of our friends in the southeast either dodged Hurricane Ian completely or survived some rain and wind without too much damage. So fingers crossed this all keeps up and we can get this year's cotton crop to the gin with little disruption. And I sure hope I'm not jinxing anything by saying that. My usual cotton companion, Beck Barnes, is out this week. So I'll be managing this episode on my own. And I think you're going to find it worth a good listen. As we all know, Bayer's been field testing new cotton varieties containing its Thrive-On insect technology trait for several years. And the results have been almost unanimously positive for management of thrips without foliar treatments and plant bug management that can can potentially eliminate one to two insecticide treatments each season. Joining us today to discuss their work with the Thrive On technology and where they believe its benefits and value lie are three state extension entomologists, Whitney Crow from Mississippi State, Scott Graham from Auburn, and C. Brown from Tennessee. I had a chance to visit with them during a meeting in Scott, Mississippi to discuss this year's insect issues, resistance concerns, and of course, Thrive On. It was a great conversation, and I'll share it with you in just a few minutes. But first, it's been a while since we looked at some news items impacting the U.S. cotton industry, so let's take a quick look at some of the recent headlines. We have some news from the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, uh, which is going to be leading a $90 million Climate Smart Cotton Program that was recently funded by USDA through its Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities Initiative. This project will help build markets for climate smart cotton and provide technical and financial assistance to more than a thousand U.S. cotton growers to advance adoption of climate smart practices to help produce more than 4 million bales of climate smart cotton over the next five years. Now, this program is a collaborative effort with Cotton Incorporated and Cotton Council International, the Soil Health Institute, the Soil and Water Outcomes Fund, Alabama A&M University, North Carolina A&T University, Texas A&M University's AgriLife Research, and the AgriCenter International in Memphis. Now, in addition to that, Trust Protocols also made two key announcements. Producer participation in the program now includes more than 1,000 members representing an estimated 1.1 million acres, and the Ralph Lauren Corporation has been welcomed as the protocol's newest member. Congratulations are in order for Steve Verrett and Kenneth Hood. They were announced by Cotton Incorporated as the 2022 honorees for the Cotton Research and Promotion Hall of Fame. This Hall of Fame recognizes individuals that have made significant contributions to the Cotton Research and Promotion Program or to the cotton industry in general. Verrett and Hood, both of whom are longtime friends of Cotton Gore Magazine, will be formally inducted during the joint Cotton Incorporated Cotton Board Annual Meeting in New Orleans in December. You can find out more details about this in our article at cottongrower.com. And finally, online registration for the 2023 Beltwide Cotton Conferences is now available. This annual conference, which is coordinated by the National Cotton Council, will be held January 10th through the 12th at the New Orleans Marriott in downtown New Orleans. Attendees can register online by clicking the registration tab on the Beltwide Conference homepage, and that's cotton.org slash beltwide. You can also find links there to information about housing reservations, registration costs, and an updated meeting program. But now it's time to hit the play button and share my conversation with Whitney Crow, Scott Graham, and C. Brown about all things related to managing cotton insects. There's been a lot of discussion this season about drought, 
about cotton economics and crop management, but there really hasn't been as much discussion about insect issues, or at least from what I've heard, and we're going to try to fix that today. Uh, joining me are three extension entomologists from the southeast and the mid-south, Whitney Crow from Mississippi State, Scott Graham from Auburn, and C. Brown from Tennessee. Thanks to all of you for taking time to, uh, to visit, and welcome to the Cotton Companion. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's start with a look back at, at this season. I think uh, I've talked to people, and it sort of seems like it's been a weird year for cotton and, and, and maybe for insects as well. What was the insect pressure like this year in, uh, in your state? So our early season insect pressure in Tennessee was uh, severe, I'd say would be the, the most appropriate term for it. Uh, tobacco thrips were extremely heavy in a lot of our, in pretty much all of our cotton acreage. Um, we had cold, wet growing conditions, which uh, really kind of uh, start our cotton struggle coming out of the ground. Then you had guys putting some pretty heavy preloads down and then coming back post with some, you know, even heavier preloads or heavy post loads, depending on what they're using. And so that really made our cotton struggle. And then the thrips came in and just absolutely started working it over. So it was a uh, seed treatments held for about till about a true leaf and then gave up the ghost. Uh, some of the cotton my plots, the thrips were burning the cotyledons off of them. I mean, they were actually killing it before it was even trying to put on a true leaf. And so um, we had extreme pressure early season and that was encountered across much of West Tennessee. Um, moved to end of the season plant bug pressure was variable although we had like most places we had some high spots other spots were very manageable we also were had a pretty serious drought one of the worst droughts we've had since what everybody was telling me since 08 i believe or 12 was about as dry as i could remember it and so our cotton the non-irrigated cotton didn't grow i mean mm -hmm. it was we were going six to seven weeks without an appreciable rainfall and the cotton was just stuck so <clears throat> that impacted growth, plant bugs. Plant bugs didn't seem to be as heavy. Plant bugs don't like drought stress cotton. They like more ru more rank, lush growing cotton. So we didn't see the numbers early like we normally do. When we did catch a rain, cotton took off, plant bugs started making their way in. Mm -hmm. Although still kind of a, kind of down, not as not as heavy as it can be. Uh, Bullworm flight was average. I mean, nothing, nothing crazy. And then we had a lot of stink bug pressure come in late as well. So we had um, kind of ran the gamut this season from early to late. Well, I'll, I'll go next and talk about Alabama, and, and you know, it's very difficult to uh, generalize a state like Alabama, where, as I've, we've mentioned in the past, you know, we, we grow cotton in 60 to 61 of our 67 counties, so a wide range of environments, a wide range of pest pressures, but in general, you know, thrips were, were pretty heavy, as Seep said, in Tennessee. I uh, saw that in Alabama. Uh, one thing we don't normally anticipate, but it's been two years in a row for us, is it seemed like our later planted cotton had more thrips pressure than our earlier planted cotton, which is normally, you know, completely opposite of what you would expect based on how cotton is growing and things like that. But really, our our thrips pressure was heavier in our later planted cotton. Plant bugs, where we had some spots where it they felt like they were in the Mississippi Delta spraying them, and we we had some places where they didn't spray them at all. Uh, really, a, a mixed bag, as Steve has said. Uh, for Tennessee as well and we had some pockets with all this drought where spider mites were a main concern and and really mites are becoming a more consistent more early season pest for us you know historically uh, my predecessor Ron Smith said you know in the I guess the pre-Timic days even spider mites were a late season pest then really they weren't a pest for a while there when, when we had Timic in the market and as we lost that uh, technology and we've got it back to as another brand but we're starting to see more issues with spider mites. They're starting to become more common early seasons. So that was something we had certain pockets of fields that they faced and sprayed two or three times during the season trying to keep them down. Uh, stink bugs were, that's our, our number one pest in Alabama and really across the southeast is stink bugs. And, and based on what we were seeing in corn, we really anticipated this is going to be a blowout stink bug year. And it didn't really come to fruition as we expected Maybe a little bit late, as C mentioned there again, in, in Tennessee, we had higher pressure. But really in that pink peak uh, bloom, you know, third, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth week of bloom, where we normally are, are really having issues with stink bugs, we didn't have them like we thought. And, and our best guess, and, and we could be wrong, but is, you know, that a lot of that drought period hit 
around mid-June when corn is starting to fill and there's a lot of stink bugs in that corn reproducing. And, and we, we really think it got so hot and dry that it just basically baked those stink bugs and the, those small uh, early instars just couldn't survive that environment. So mm -hmm. that really knocked down the population. Then it took them a while to build back up and, and move into cotton. So stink bugs weren't still required one to two sprays in some instances, maybe three, but weren't as consistent in basically every field like we're used to seeing. Uh, bowl worms are, are, you know, you can find one here or there. It's almost exciting when you see a bowl worm <laughs> in Alabama, believe it or not. Uh, you know, that's something we try to tell folks is just because they're talking about bowl worms in Mississippi and Arkansas doesn't mean we need to be looking for them and missing stink bugs. And for the most part, we don't get too, too tied up into that. But there is no normal year with cotton insects. That's what makes it fun. There's no normal week. You know, mm -hmm. one week's different from the next, and it's a, a cotton insect uh, management is completely different from all other aspects of cotton production and really all aspects of agricultural production in general. That's what makes it exciting. Uh, but, yeah, we were, this year as much as any, we were field to field and week to week with our insect situation as a whole. Whitney, how did I Mississippi would, fare? I would say Mississippi probably wasn't a whole lot different. Thrips were heavier than normal the last couple of years. They have been a lot like what Seed was seeing in Tennessee. Our seed treatments are providing some control, but more times than not, we're needing to follow that up with foliar applications. And I would say a lot of acres got at least one application, if not two. And then uh, once we started progressing into the season, we also had issues with spider mites. Uh, there were issues in just pockets, both in the hills in the delta of mississippi as far as for plant bugs i would say we started out on a relatively i would say more light generally we tend to see more adult applications uh, pre-bloom in the hills the last couple of years i would say that was pretty typical i would say as we progress through the season those populations began to pick up but i would say we were still below a normal year as far as plant bug pressure with the exception of some pockets that were real, still real heavy, still made mm -hmm. a number of insecticide applications. And then as far as bowl worms, our bowl worm flight was heavier than normal this year. I would say we're still expecting one to two diamide applications in two gene cotton. And then our three gene cotton is still holding well and not needing to make any insecticide applications in that technology. Okay, that's good. Uh it's interesting to, that all three of you mentioned the uh, the resistance issue with uh, with early season treatments for thrips. Um, what's the status on that? What kind of are there any traditional options that are still viable? Uh, kind of what are you recommending to growers in your state right now? Well, and I'll, I'll let Steve kind of talk about some of the work they're doing for really the cotton belt uh, in terms of foliar sprays, but a lot of we know we've got resistance to most of our seed treatments. We've got issues, uh, and and Whitney and Steve can talk about this as well. But you know, a lot of it is is weather dependent. If you've got really good growing conditions, sometimes the seed treatment might get you through. If you've got really poor growing conditions and the cotton's not growing, seed treatment's not going to get you through. You know, in states where you can use out a carb, it, it still is is probably the best cotton insecticide we've ever had, and it still provides very good control. But in in most fields, in most years, we're needing to supplement our at plant treatments, whether that's an, an infuro spray of imidacloprid or acephate or a, a seed treatment. We're needing mm -hmm. to uh, supplement those at some level. Okay. So what our lab is looking at is kind of a continuation of what Scott Stewart started. Uh, with his graduate student and so we decided to continue that going forward um, because i'm a big fan of trend lines and data sets so i think it's you know if somebody's doing something for more than two years it needs to be continued if it's value so and this provides a lot of value to us in the mid-south um, so what our data is finding is that the we are seeing high levels of resistance to organophosphates and our foliar thrips mm -hmm. applications so specifically orthene and dicotophos or bidrin and so pretty much every population I tested, with the exception of one out of Louisiana, came back resistant. And so to acephate and bidrin. Um, and that's across the Mid-South, not the, just Louisiana. This is the Mid-South and one population out of North Carolina. So uh, I got one population out of peanuts in North Carolina, and it was also resistant to ordinary. So uh, it really kind of limits our options as a foliar. I mean, we have one option left, which is Intrepid Edge. Mm -hmm. And so we only need the spinadoram component out of that. We don't. It's a premix of methoxy or intrepid, and 
spinatorama radiant we only need it for the radiant component and so but because of that it's expensive and mm-hmm. so where guys are used to spending two dollars on orthene now they're spending close to ten dollars for intrepid edge and so it's driven our foliar control costs through the roof for thrips now that we're starting to see resistance and we're going to expand this you know hopefully next year maybe scott can send me some populations out of alabama if you want um, try to get some maybe out of the east to see if we can build a big set on this see if this is just a mid-south problem or if it's it appears to or if it's going to start appearing moving to the east now david kearns out of texas would send us a population his unfortunately didn't make it in the mail they they died in, in route but david's population historically has always been susceptible and mm-hmm. so and i think that's a lot of it is they don't you know you, know, you can ponder about why I don't think they use a lot of orthene in Texas. It's just so hot, so dry. Everybody's afraid of spider mites. Um, cotton grows off well. They don't necessarily always need thrips overspray. So mm-hmm. the orthene selection pressure in Texas doesn't hasn't seemed to be as high as it has been in the Mid-South, where, you know, like Tennessee guys have been spraying orthene for 30 years, for whether it's needed or and not. on everything. On everything. On everything. Yeah, yeah. And multiple and, crops. And then yeah. you've got seed treatments with orthene now and infro applications with orthene. And so that's all that's doing, I think, is driving selection pressure. And, and, so, and there's no other options yeah. as far as seed treatments because we became reliant on acephate. So we're pretty much limited to gaucho or eris, and eris tends to be harder to find. And then you have the ag logic component, but the, the problem with that is, is one, it's expensive, and two, you have to be set up to put granular and furrow, so that causes some additional complications. So based off of Seeb's results, we're pretty much limited to one seed treatment and one foliar insecticide applications for thrips management. Okay, well, speaking of thrips, um, we're sitting here in Scott, Mississippi today. Uh, we've been taking a look at the Thrive On technology uh, that's going to bring in-plant protection for, you know, from thrips and uh, implant bugs. And all of you have had an opportunity to work with this technology for, for a couple of years. Um, what are your initial impressions? How's it going to fit in your states? We're talking about thrips. Thrips. Okay. Um, from a thrip standpoint in Mississippi, it, it looks really good. Uh, there's not currently a need to make a foliar application because that damage is so minimal. So that will eliminate a foliar application in the system. We do tend to still see thrips and we do still see some minor damage. So that'll be something to take into consideration. Um, herbicide injury sometimes can manifest as thrip symptomology, so other things that will need to be considerate of. But in, at least in Mississippi, it looks really good and currently don't plan on making foliar applications initially. Yeah, and very similar in Alabama, uh, and really I think across the whole cotton belt. It's, it's very impressive on thrips. Uh, you know, we, we give it two thumbs up. Uh, we don't anticipate. Uh, any of our observations, we don't anticipate any need for foliar supplemental sprays for thrips. Uh, of course, you can never say never. An important thing to remember is you are going to see thrips on it. Uh, it's not something that just kills them and they die and you never see them. Uh, like, like maybe VIP is on bollworms where you just never see the caterpillars with this. You're going to see thrips, but if you watch that cotton, they're, they're not hurting it. It may be a little bit of cosmetic damage, but they're not doing economic damage. Uh, we, we're really excited about this technology. As Steve mentioned, we've got a lot of issues with, with resistance. We're kind of scratching our heads thinking, what are we going to do when, when these are no longer viable at all? And this technology is really going to help us out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, I mean, uh, we're, Tennessee's definitely excited to have it, see it. I mean, it's a lot of growers I spoke to over the year have really been, they tell me, you know, they planted their Thrive On right next to non-Thrive On, and it was night and day difference. And it's the same thing I've seen. And my plots, and I've looked at Thrive On for, I mean, it's over five years now. So it's been, I've just looked at it a long time. This is the best thrift pressure I've had was in Tennessee. So, Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't see a blip. I mean, it was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very impressive. It's a good, it'll be a very useful tool, especially to growers in my geography, that thrips are primary all, you know, yearly concern for cotton, especially if this cold, wet trend seems to hold because it's, you know, while everybody else is at the beach and at the lake on Memorial Day, you know, everybody in Tennessee is in jackets because it's 50 degrees <laughs> and the wind's blowing and it's just, you know, you, you got two inches of rain on top of it. And it's yep. like, well, you know, there goes my cotton crop. So it's, um, you know, it, it it's definitely going to, I think it's going to make, it's going to change a lot of things 
and our geography. And it's going to make a lot of it's. There's going to be some changes with us as entomologists, as how we like as Scott had mentioned and Whitney had both. You know how we recommend management of this crop because mm-hmm. it's not going forward. I don't know if there's any other technology that we see that is like this in a like a BT trait. I mean, it's most of your corn and cotton is it's a direct mortality. I mean, it kills them. Mm-hmm. You don't see it. This you still see them, but there may not be causing the damage. So. Hopefully a mind shift. Yeah, it's going to be. A, it's going to take a shift in management tactics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not a major shift, but it's going to be. It's going to take some education on our part to educate our growers. Yeah, yeah. No, so. I, I think one of, one of the statements that I heard heard you guys bring up earlier today was sort of like it, trying to put it in layman's terms. And I think Scott, you mentioned the steak and hot dog mm. comparison, and, and Steve, you mentioned restaurant <laughs> comparison. Can you elaborate on that? Does just a little bit. So the the restaurant comparison I made I made it a field day somewhere I think <laughs> is it so I equate it to like non thrive on cotton this is in relation to thrips so you know everybody likes their you know you've got a favorite restaurant you go eat there you know it's like I like that I'm gonna bring my family I'm gonna yank my kids along bring my in laws you know bring the whole family to eat this restaurant Bustler, bring- yeah we're gonna we're gonna set up shop here we like coming here we're gonna keep coming back to eat. Well, then you go to another restaurant you don't like, and it's like, ugh, I'm not going back. I'm definitely not bringing my kids. So, I mean, and it's kind of the same way. <laughs> same way with what I equate it to Thrive On is that, you know, thrips are going to come in. They don't like it. They, It's not direct mortality. I mean, you know, it's not mm-hmm. going to kill you, but you're not going to want to come in, set up shop, and they're not, there's, the components aren't there for them to reproduce, lay a bunch of eggs like it would be on normal Thrive On, or right. non-Thrive On, excuse me. So, that's you kind of seen that that my restaurant comparison. I've used that a few times over the over, yeah. you know my entomology career in different it's a good one to forms. So, it is a good you know, everybody in the south yeah. likes to eat, so yeah. I, mean, I figured. It's, <laughs> so. And steaks and hot dogs are part of that too. Yeah, right? and I like to eat both of those. Uh, but so that's actually an analogy I got from our, our colleague at the University of Georgia, Philip Roberts, and he talks about you know if you've got the option of a steak and a hot dog you're going to choose a steak 10 times out of 10, basically. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the idea in these replicated small plot trials that we're doing where there's 38 to 40 inches separating the steak and the, and the hot dog. It's easy to find the steak and eat that. Well, when we take this technology into large acres, well, maybe now the steak is, you know, several miles away, or am I just going to eat that hot dog because that's all I've got here? And so we've been able over the past year or two to evaluate some 20, 30, 40 acre blocks of Thrive On. And I mean, I've walked all the way across one side of the field to the other. And it it really holds up in in those uh, situations where we're still not seeing uh, as many thrips and not seeing the damage in this Thrive On. And that's important because as we kind of alluded to, I don't know if we've outright said this or not, but it's it's really uh, the... Uh, the the mode of action, if you will, is not killing. It's they just don't like it. We, mm-hmm. I call it a non-preference. They prefer something else. Some people call it avoidance or repellency, however you want to call it. They they don't. There's something about the taste or something that gives them a stomach ache. We don't know. They just eat it and don't like it. So a seed is said. We we've, we've done some work where they actually lay fewer eggs in it. The the mom can can taste it and say, hey, I'm definitely not bringing my children here. To his point, <laughs> and they find somewhere else to take them. Quite literally. And uh, so we just, you know, there's a little bit of concern when you're bringing stuff out that you've done in small replicated plots or in a greenhouse. What is this going to do in the real world? Because you never know. And and our observations to this point across, I know across the southeast, we did a, a project as a group, and it's it's really held up that we're not seeing excessive thrips injury. We're still seeing thrips, but but not a whole lot of them. Uh, when we compare two fields across the turn row that are not thrive on, we're seeing a lot more damage there and a lot more thrips. So that that's something that's encouraging for us moving mm-hmm. forward. Whitney, you need an analogy, obviously. Obviously, I don't have one. I'm going to have to think of one. I'm going to have to step in my game. I'm slacking as an entomologist <laughs> over here. Well, I, I stole mine. At least Steve's was his own fault. So. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Scott, one of the things you mentioned when we were out looking at the, at the plot, you mentioned there were some hidden benefits to this technology. Can you kind of elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, and so those hidden benefits are kind of when we shift later in the season into the plant bug window. So mm-hmm. this this trait, for people who don't know, is it's really pretty novel that it, you know, we think about our, our bowl guards, they're getting the heliothion complex. So it's multiple species. Well, they're getting a lot, I guess, with 
army worms and soybean loopers and that kind of stuff. But really our target pests are boll worm and bud worm, which are basically cousins. With this, we're getting thrips and, and we're getting uh, protection from plant bugs, which are no way related at all. So that's really unique from this trait that we're seeing that. And it's the, the very same thing. It's a lot more of it is non-preference than it is. It's not necessarily killing them. And so what we see is is delayed development of the population, not, well, in, in terms of size of the population, but more so what I'm trying to describe is how they they grow from, you know, one growth stage to the next growth stage. So it's taking them a longer period of time to mature as they're in the field. And as anybody, you know, uh, your dad's going to eat a bigger steak than his six-year-old son is, or he's going to eat more hot dogs than his son is. Same thing. The, the bigger you get, the more you eat. Well, these plant bugs, the more they eat, that means the more damage they're doing. Well, when, when we lengthen out this window and, and delay their development, they're doing less damage as we're getting to the field, as, as they're, they're feeding. If you look at a state like Alabama, who's got a lot of what we would call pockets of cotton here and there and yonder, and you're farming in three or four different counties, sometimes it can take two weeks to get across with mm -hmm. the sprayer. Well, in these situations where you just can't get there, you're you're getting some infill protection from those plant bugs because they're just simply not doing the same amount of damage in this thrive on cotton as they're doing in the non thrive on cotton. Now, the reason I call that a hidden benefit is how do I prove that if all I've got is thrive on cotton? Right. You can't, right? Mm -hmm. You can try to look back at previous years and try to look, look at, you know, yields, but then there's germplasm and things. So it really is a hidden benefit, and it's it's something that I don't know how we ever prove it or disprove it to anybody in a real-world situation. But I I think in, in low-pressure areas in particular where we're not in a six, seven, eight, nine Mississippi Delta spray environment, that's really where we get some value from this technology on plant bugs or the, these hidden hidden mm -hmm. values. Okay. I got one last question on this. Obviously, what we've heard today, there's still some regulatory hurdles that have to be cleared on this, but it looks like we're headed toward a sort of a targeted, stewarded rollout, limited rollout for 2023. What advice would you give growers who may be planning to try it? I would, I would say that you know it's you're going to have to. There's some things that you can take with you from growing cotton. You know that cultural, you know, planting date. There's fertilizer. Nothing, none of that's going to change. You know, fertilize agronomically like you normally mm -hmm. do. What what your ground requires. The thing coming entomologically going forward is that. You know, because you have, let's say, thrips. If you have thrips on the plants, that doesn't mean you have to spray it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, you've got to, you know, let's say, listen to your consultant, and then hopefully, you know, listen to, you know, what we're telling you is, you know, as extension entomologists that we've had a lot of a lot of work with this this product, and you know, you don't necessarily have to be, you don't have to stop spraying pre's on your soybeans to unload and go mix up intrepid edge or whatever to go spray your thrive on. You're, you're not going to mm -hmm. need that. It may have thrips on it, but that doesn't mean that they're causing any kind of economic damage. And with plant bugs, it's going to be kind of similar where you can we call it kind of lag time or a slop time, depending on you know which, how you want to use your word, that if your consultant or your scout tells you on Monday you're approaching threshold and you're three counties away, you don't have to drop everything you're doing to go hit it on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It can potentially, now you need to listen to your consultant, and there's a lot of caveats to this, but if it's dealing with immatures, you know, not necessarily adults, you could potentially ride that if you can't make it to Friday. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to take your crop away from you. I said there's a lot of generalizations in that. You know, adults can do some damage. They do. We see very similar amounts of damage. This is you're getting into bloom. You know, you don't, you can be a little bit more timely. You can get some other things accomplished. You don't have to be, you know, as quick pulling the trigger. You know, like mm -hmm. if I got the report Monday, i got to be there Monday night and this, or Monday evening. That's not necessarily the way with Thrive On it's got to be. Yeah, I, so. I think the way you described it is plant it as far away from your shed, from your farm shed as, as possible. Yeah, that's that's all I've been telling growers in Tennessee is to plant it as far, <laughs> far away as you can. Not to say that you can set it and forget it, but yeah. it gives you time that if you, I like, call it the lag time, if you've got a lag mm -hmm. where you can't get your sprayer <clears throat> or you can't get it, the airplanes tied up and you can't get them over there and it takes you five days to get there or three days you know, plant bugs aren't going to take your crop from you like they would yeah. potentially in a non-thrive-on type setting where you go from 
you know, 90% square root tension down to 50. You know, you may go from 90 to 83. Mm-hmm. Or you may you may not lose any. It just kind of depends on, very situationally dependent, but that's overall generalization. Mm-hmm. So. Whitney, what do you think? I would say I completely agree with everything that Sieb said, and he really gave the major points. But I think the biggest thing is just being open-minded to this technology because it is different than what we're traditionally used to. So it may be a little bit uncomfortable to see thrips or to see thrips injury in the field, but based off of the research, we don't need to spray it yet. And then to get the true benefit of the plant bugs, it's really critical to spray on that recommended threshold so that we can hopefully eliminate one to two insecticide applications. So it is different. While it's a similar, we're still going to scout it and spray it similarly to Mm -hmm. traditional systems. It's just a little bit of a mindset shift. And I think Think that's different for people especially in the mississippi delta where they're used to being in the field you know two times a week and they're making right. applications uh pretty quickly after they've been in the field so i think that's the biggest thing is mm-hmm. just being open-minded and learning how to really take care of this technology to get the true benefit of it yeah scott i think you said you'd plant this right up beside the road yeah well yeah i want <laughs> folks to see it because as i've said if, if you know the term it looks like cotton and it, it looks like cotton but no C makes a very good point what it does too but with the planet maybe places that are harder to get to because you do have a little bit more opportunity to get there and another thing i would say especially as we we start having somewhat limited acres and things Put it in the situations where you need the most thrips benefit. In other words, if if you do use uh, the thrips infestation predictor model, or if you know, man, for seven out of ten years, if I plant it this week, I'm going to have crazy thrips pressure. Put it there. Put it where you can maximize that thrips benefit, because really that's that's one of the biggest things that we get out of it. And uh, another thing I would point out is just remember. Anytime we change the system, we don't know what's going to happen. One of the principles of IPM is anything you do can have an unintended consequence that you would have never thought of. Uh, I know my predecessor at Auburn, Ron Smith, can tell you when in Alabama was one of the only places in the country, or the only place in the country, where bolt weevil eradication and BT cotton happened basically the same time. And he had to go back to a textbook from like 1925 to find out people knew stink bugs were a pest of cotton and stink bugs just flew off with the crop. Mm-hmm. So you got to keep scouting, even in that thrips window where we're saying you don't need to treat it. You still need to be looking for spider mites, things like that. Uh, Cause we just don't know, you know, some of these thrips we have early season are also predators of mites and can help keep those populations down. So we, we've got to keep scouting this cotton. Uh, and, and even in the plant bug window, still be observing for other weird things happening. Cause when this does get thrown into a, a large acreage situation, we, we don't really know what what little tweaks to the system could have big consequences. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think this is probably a good spot to uh, to wrap this up. I certainly appreciate all of you taking the time to uh, to sit down and visit. This is always these are always fun conversations. <laughs> so, anyway, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll catch up with you guys again. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. A special thanks to Whitney Crow, Scott Graham, and C. Brown for their time and valuable input. And as always, thanks to you, dear listeners, for joining us. If you like what you hear on the Cotton Companion, please be sure to spread the word and tell your friends about this podcast. Here's where and how they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, The Cotton Grower E-News, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. The Cotton Companion Podcast is produced twice monthly by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues at the World Headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in Willoughby, Ohio. I'm Jim Stedman, and Beck Barnes and I will be back with you in two weeks for the next episode of The Cotton Companion. Until then, stay safe and pick clean. 
Yeah, he works and he works and he works and he works all day. God made a farmer. 